for coming, everybody. Really nice to see so many faces this early in the morning. Uh, I usually start work at 10, so this is a little bit unusual for me, to be honest. Um, I'm excited to talk today, and, and what an awesome theme, uh, the topic of education. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this topic, and so I'm going to share a few of them with you today. I want to talk about designing a school from scratch. Uh, and you know, as I go through this, if all of you want to maybe think back to your own school experiences and the things you liked and didn't like about it, and it's kind of fun to reflect. If you could start from scratch, if you could just wipe everything we've got out and start from the beginning, you know, what would you do, or what, how would you change it, or what would you implement? So that's me. Uh, I'm Heather uh, at Heather Payne on Twitter. If you want to tweet some stuff, P A Y N E. So we spend most of our lives in school. Most of us probably started in school uh, at the age of three or four with kindergarten. We then go through you know, 12 years of grade school, public school, first elementary, and then middle school, and then high school. Uh, probably lots of us in this room went on to post-secondary, so maybe college or universities. So that's another you know, two or four years. Um, so when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, we've probably, many of us in this room, even spent 17 years of our lives in school. And uh, I've been out of school for five years now, uh, and I'm not sure if it's a coincidence that those five years have been the best of my life. <laughs> <clears throat> I want to talk for a second uh, about the history of the modern day schools, the school system as we know it today, or, or that most of us go through if you went through the public school system. Um, public schools as we know them today came around, came to be in sort of the 1850s. Uh, there was this guy named Horace Mann. He became the Secretary of Education in Massachusetts. And he sort of went on this mission where he wanted to sort of totally like modernize um, and, and change the school system. Up until then, it had been a lot of like one room schoolhouses and that kind of thing. And he decided he was going to sort of take this model that seemed to be working in Prussia and bring it over uh, to America. Um, so he first stated a, created a statewide system of teachers, started training teachers professionally to do that job, um, and he really believed in the model of common schools where every, every child would have access to the same content. He sort of wanted to standardize uh, education. Um, he also introduced the idea of age grading for the first time. So that's where, based on your age, you get put into a class uh, with other kids your age, and you know you progress through these different grades. Sort of whether or not you know your aptitude was different than people in your year, that didn't really matter. Um, and then they also implemented the lecture method that was really popular in European universities, uh, where students were more like passive recipients of knowledge rather than actively being part of what was being taught to them. Um, and he got a lot of support for this method. Uh, he sort of argued that universal public education was going to be a great way to, I don't know, turn the nation's unruly young people uh, into like disciplined citizens. And uh, people loved that. He got widespread approval. And uh, more, and more, school, more and more schools were sort of created and, and built uh, based on this model. Um, and the issue is that, like, that was sort of the last innovation. Like that was the last time that at least the public school system really did something interesting on a, on a wide scale. Um, and it's the same sort of system that we adopted here in Canada. So for many of you, that probably is a lot like what your school system was like. Obviously, here and there, you will have a great teacher, we'll have a great project, and things like that. But for the most part, that's sort of what our school system is today. And I have a bunch of problems with this, um, more than I have time to list today. Um, but the first problem I have with, with the school system is we're told uh, exactly what to learn. Uh, there's sort of this set of things that they believe, they believe that we should learn in school. And the other problem is we do a lot of memorizing. Like this is one of my strongest memories of school is just how much stuff you have to memorize and regurgitate. And that for some reason is that skill of memorizing and then regurgitating is what determines a lot of our earliest options in life. It determines whether we can take college level or university level classes in high school. It determines what university or college we might be able to get into. You know, as I've gotten older, what I've realized is this is really unfair because there are a lot of different kinds of talents. Um, and if for you, memorizing and regurgitating is not a talent, the school system is, is not really going to, going to serve you too well. 
And it's also sad, like, there are lots of talents that, you know, we would all be as a society really served if we encouraged people to develop, but that doesn't really, doesn't have a place in our school system. The other thing I don't like is that we learn only with kids our own age. This is like the only time in our lives that we get put in a class and, and kind of stuck with a group of people that are exactly the same age as us, with like a, in a one-year band. And you know, once you become an adult and you enter the world and the workforce and stuff like that, that never happens again. You don't even have to you know, date people your own age or be friends with people your own age. But for the first like, 17, 18 years of our lives, like, that's who we hang out with. And you know, it doesn't matter if we're ahead of our peers in a certain area, if you're, you know, have a really strong aptitude for math, it doesn't really matter. You're still with kids your own age. Or if you have some weaknesses that maybe put you a little bit behind your age group. You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're just with this group anyway. Um, it also doesn't matter, I guess, that it's been proven that putting kids in a group with other kids, you know, the older kids will inspire the younger kids to learn to read, to learn math, to learn to tie their shoes. That doesn't matter. And also, having younger kids around can encourage uh, a lot of empathy um, development and leadership skills. Uh, so that stuff doesn't matter either. Um, the other thing, this is the third one I'm going to mention today, we progress uh, in school at a rate determined entirely by other people. Um, teachers or principals or the Ministry of Education, they're the ones who choose uh, how quickly we move on and, and how long we have for each subject or each topic. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't know how long division actually works. All that matters is that you can follow the procedure. And that will be enough to get an A on, on a test. It's just to memorize how to do long division and do it. Um, and I think actually that's one of the biggest problems um, with, with why people don't like math, is because we don't spend enough time actually like discovering the mystery of it. And that happens in all different kinds of subjects. And so these are just a few of my current issues with our school system. And if I had more time, I would definitely have some, some more to share. But it's true that our school system hasn't changed. Uh, when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter that you know, in, in the almost coming up on 200 years since the last like, innovation in education, it doesn't matter that like, you know, we started driving cars and the internet came to be and, and the economy is entirely different. Um, that stuff doesn't matter. We're still teaching things the same way. So I actually entered um, the education space sort of by accident. Uh, it was. Well, to take you back a little bit further, it was 2009 when I first started teaching myself how to code. Um, and I did it basically as a way to add an extra skill, a cool skill, to my resume. Um, and it was only through using Google and kind of figuring it out on my own that I realized I really liked it. Uh, I just didn't have the exposure early on in my life to sort of guide me in that direction sooner. And so fast forward two years, I'd been learning on my own for, for quite a while. And uh, mostly, to be honest, mostly unsuccessfully. There would be some months when you know, I'd, I'd figure out how to get something to work, or I'd come across a good tutorial and, and make some progress. And then some months when like, I would just get so frustrated, I would give up for a few weeks. And so in uh, 2011, um, I tweeted about the idea of uh, workshops in Toronto for women who want to learn how to code. And uh, that was. It, it really sort of took off quickly. The idea was popular. It was maybe an idea whose time had come. Lots of people wanted to learn this stuff by that point. And so we started doing these workshops. And has anyone here been to a Ladies Learning Code workshop? Ooh, lots. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, it was really exciting. We started doing these workshops. The first one was August 6th of 2011. Uh, we taught JavaScript. And uh, it was really cool, but it was also, you know, it was cool and it was concerning at the same time. The reason it was cool is because we were like, wow, look at all these people who are interested in learning to code. We can definitely do some stuff for these folks. We can do some interesting things. But what kind of concerned me is like there was so much excitement about it that it kind of showed me how lacking we are of really high quality educational experiences. Like a, a workshop on HTML CSS should not get us that excited. <laughs> but like, I don't know, it just, it, it worked, and people were excited about it, and, and that's when I really started thinking, you know, this is a really interesting space. The education space is really interesting, and, and that's when I started learning more about it. And just to give you a quick update on Ladies Learning Code now, um, they're a nonprofit, uh, as most of you will probably know. Uh, they're now in uh, 
22 cities across Canada doing a workshop almost every month in, in those different communities. And I haven't run the organization for a year now. So I stepped away uh, last year to focus on Hacker U, which I'll tell you more about soon. Uh, and so it's been co-led by Melissa Cernick and Laura Plant. Uh, and they have their own team of seven uh, running the organization, doing lots of great stuff for adults and also for, for youth. So if you haven't checked out a workshop, I definitely recommend uh, checking them out. And if you have kids, their stuff for kids is, is just amazing. Um, so, basically, when Ladies Learning Code kind of started taking off and we saw how excited people were about it, we started thinking, you know, what if you could do something like this but make it longer? Because it's easy to do a one-day workshop really well, I think. You know, you, you have a day, you have great people in the room, you have delicious catering, um, you teach them some amazing stuff, and, and people will be pretty excited when they go home. But it's a totally different thing to try and create a course that teaches somebody a skill from the ground up you know, over several months. Or you know, I even started wondering, can we create something that could be like a college experience in terms of developing the skills you know, in, a, in a different way, in a, in a start from scratch way, in a way that sort of eliminates the thinking of all the ways that our school system today has, been, has sort of created these courses typically. So, this is what I wanted to know. What if you could start from scratch and design a school from the ground up? And that was a really interesting question and an interesting problem. And so that's what we did with HackerU. For those of you who don't know, HackerU is a coding bootcamp, uh, professional development type uh, school located at Queen and Spadina now downtown. And uh, we kind of had a blank slate with HackerU. We kind of thought like, Okay, we've learned a bunch of stuff about teaching people how to code through these Ladies Learning Code workshops, and now we want to do a course, like a really great course. And, and eventually we started doing full-time courses as well, where people join us for nine weeks full-time. And we wanted to know, like, what if we just did it the way that it should be, with like students in mind uh, the whole time? So it was February of 2012 when we first had the idea, and um, we really thought about, and we like had this question, like, what would we want? If we were students here, like, what would we want to do? And this was sort of the framework that we used for deciding you know, what our MVP would be or what sort of the basic product would be. Um, and it was easy to think back because I had started learning to code not that long ago. So it was easy for me to sort of think back and say, like, what would I have wanted back then? And to be honest, this, when we're talking about creativity, uh, this has really always been my way. Um, if you give me a problem that I'm not a customer for, I have almost no idea what to do. I probably won't be very useful. But if you give me a problem that's my own problem, if there's a problem in my, in my life that I want to solve, that's when you know, the wheels really start turning. I can start to think of some really interesting, interesting things to do with that. So we immediately knew um, some things that we wanted to try with this experiment. And uh, we still call it, we always called it and still call it an experiment because that's exactly what it is. Uh, a whole bunch of us, you know, we don't have any formal training uh, in this area. I actually am not even that great of a developer, to be honest with you. Um, so we called it an experiment and it kind of got people on board with the idea that we're just going to try a bunch of stuff. Our heart is in the right place. We really care. And uh, it allowed people to kind of work with us and, and definitely made it easier for people to give us feedback and for us to change and adapt as time went on. Um, and what we also wanted really was to do the opposite of a lot of the stuff that we had experienced in school. That was like a really good starting point as well. So the first thing that we did that we decided we would do is uh, everything we do, everything we teach, is hands-on and project-based. And if, I don't know if, if you, my university experience and my high school experience didn't have a lot of this stuff in it. Projects were usually essays, which although I agree it's useful to learn how to write, um, don't really always give you a sense of you know, what a job is gonna be like or, or what, what you can even do with your skills and talents. And so um, we just decided that we would rather have people learn through doing than through us telling them stuff. And it makes sense, obviously, that like this is the best way to learn to code. So um, typically in our classes, you're coding for about half of the class, or if you're with us for full days, you're coding for about half of that day. And um, you, know, you learn things, you learn a bunch of different things, and then you use the things you learn to build full projects from scratch. So it's kind of a very real world experience. Um, it's, it's quite a lot like what being a developer is really like. And that, I think, is one of the best ways for people to assess if this is something that they, they love or they really want to do. 
And to be honest, like with that much coding built into the course, people are always really surprised by how far they can go um, in just you know, three months part time or, or even nine weeks full time, something like that. The second thing we wanted that was different from school was cutting edge curriculum. So no textbooks. Um, the whole thing about textbooks is pretty weird anyway, because you print it once and then it's supposed to last three or four or five years. And that might work in history class or something like that, but it obviously doesn't work when you're teaching people about technology. And so we built this into the, into the plans for the school. Um, we uh, made it so that we take two weeks off at least between each course to give our instructors time to review the content and make changes and, and shuffle things around and make things better. We also host all of our content on GitHub, which is like a collaboration tool. And so our students actually, as we're going through a lesson, can post their own edits or suggest changes, fix our typos and things like that. So it's made the feeling, the curriculum has always felt very collaborative um, and it's also allowed us to make sure that we're always teaching the latest and greatest because as soon as we're not, we're really not doing our job. Uh, we also wanted uh, our teachers and our instructors to be industry experts. I cared mostly that they were great developers. Uh, I want to learn as a student from somebody who's done it, who's been there. Um, and uh, the thing that's neat is there are lots of people who are super good at a specific topic or in an industry or in a role. So there's lots of good developers, great developers, who have a gift for teaching. And uh, we've been lucky at HackerU um, to be able to bring those people on. And having them teach every single day makes them amazing at teaching. Like having them teach beginners over and over different ways or come up with different ways of doing it has been a super awesome way for them to develop teaching skills even further. And so now at this point, I would say our instructors and developers, they're one thing together, um, are really some of the most talented teachers I've probably ever met, uh, just from practicing and doing it over and over. Um, and they also know how to code, and they're coding often um, in, during the day sometimes, uh, outside of class and afterwards. And actually, I have them right now. We're on a break. Uh, we don't start classes again until January 19th. And so for this amount of time, for about three months, they're coding a new HackerU website. So they're just like back in it again, doing it, making sure that you know, in the past year as they've been teaching, they haven't lost their skills. Um, I think it's nice to not make them as well focus on research. You know, that's always one of the weird things about universities is universities are judged partially on how much research they produce, but it's like, shouldn't we be judging them on how happy their students are? Not sure. The other thing, small classes and a low ratio. I've been, and I'll, I'm sure most of you in this room who went to university have been in lecture halls where this is the size of the class. And you're supposed to be learning economics or philosophy or psychology or something like that in a classroom this size or even bigger. And of course at that point, and like it is today, it's one to many. It's me telling you something and unfortunately today all you can do is listen for a while, we'll have some questions afterwards. Um, but I don't think this is a great forum for like learning difficult things. Uh, and so what we did instead is we have small classes, 25 to 30 students, and uh, at least 10 to one ratio of students to instructors. Um, sometimes it's eight to one. And that ratio means that a, it can be a little bit more personalized. If you are falling behind, somebody can be there to, to bring you back up. If you need more of a challenge, somebody can be there to offer more of a challenge and give you something to work on. And so the small ratio is probably one of the most important things about HackerU. And then like with all this stuff, like just to give you a sense of, of why it's also creative, is like all of this stuff, all of these ideas have to also fit into a business plan. Right? Like it has to be like, okay, so we want to take breaks between each course, we want to have three instructors, and we need the cost of the thing to be affordable. Like that's where, for me, that's where this all becomes very interesting, is like coming up with a whole list of things that I want to have in a school, and then making it so that it can actually run, and you can pay your rent, and you can have a team that you need, and stuff like that. Finally, I think finally, yeah, there's uh, no tests or exams, and this, I think, you know, when you think about traditional education, this is probably one of the things that stands out for all of us the most is constantly being tested and quizzed and, and uh, having to do exams to prove what you know, constantly having to do that. And I just had this philosophy that if you put people in a room who want to be there, and you know, in this case, they do want to be there because they're paying for the course and they're making this time commitment, but if you put people like that in a room and you put them with an instructor who really loves to teach, it's just 
there's no point in having an exam or a test. It's like they're going to be motivated, all of them, on their own. And this has been absolutely true. I for sure believe that if we had put you know, exams or tests in place, even quizzes, um, it kind of creates like a ceiling. It's like as long as you do this much work or you get to this level, you get an A. And for all of you in, in this room, maybe that's what, you know, that's what we all used to strive for, is like do this much work and get an A. But what's happened by not putting an upper limit on what we expect from people, they have absolutely blasted right through you know, that ceiling that we would have set. And actually, what's interesting is every single time we run a course, uh, people's results are better than the last groups. The projects they make are better, what, how much they learn is better. We can fit more in every time we do it as we get better at teaching as well. And, and I think why this happens is people look at the previous group and they sort of look at some great projects from that group and they think, oh, well, I can at least do that. And so what we're seeing is like every single time the group kind of outdoes the, the previous group. And I feel like if we'd, if we'd set a ceiling ever, we would have kind of gotten there and it wouldn't have been very interesting. And also like that ceiling would have to move. And like how do you even, that's really complicated. You know, it's like I'd rather people just try and take it as far as they want to. And, and that's exactly what they've been doing. Um, there's two more kind of cool things about HackerU that I'll mention today. Um, one is that we created a really cool place for people to hang out. Um, I know Creative Mornings is passionate about this, like cool spaces, and, and, and I am too. Uh, you know, we never wanted, even when we started Ladies Learning Code, we didn't want to run those workshops in like U of T classrooms. Like that just wasn't the right vibe. And so we did them at the Center for Social Innovation, or we did them at Mozilla, or we did them at other cool tech companies who would have us. And then this year when we finally were ready to move into like a grown-up office, um, we worked with an interior designer to sort of create a space where students will have some area to hang out, where there's classrooms that are kind of beautiful, um, you know, a full kitchen with a stove so that you have somewhere you know, to cook your dinner if you want to or whatever. And it was a really fun project. It was probably one of my most favorite projects I've ever done, working with an interior designer to design a space. And we're so proud of it. And, and one of the best things is students just hang out there all the time. Like I left the office maybe two days ago and uh, there was a game night happening that they had organized on their own. And people are just playing games and hanging out. And I just thought that was awesome, like really cool. The, the other thing, and this is, um, I think this is pretty unique to HackerU. We have a really nice alignment of incentives between who gets accepted to the programs and, and what happens to them afterwards. So I actually interview every single person who applies to HackerU myself. Um, I probably spend about, I do about a thousand interviews a year. So if you can imagine, I'm probably doing like four to five to six interviews a day, uh, half hour interviews. It's a lot. Um, a lot of people think I'm totally crazy for doing this. Like, can I just not be such a control freak or something? And uh, the thing for me is that, you know, first of all, it gives me the chance to really find out what it is they're looking for and, and sort of coach them or, or let them know if I think that the course is gonna get them where they're trying to go, if it's gonna give them you know, a way to reach their goals. So that's really helpful. And the second thing is, especially for our, our boot camp program where people are quitting their jobs and you know, paying us $7,000 to come for nine weeks, it sounds crazy. Um, and for that program, I really like that. I choose who gets in. I interview people and, and you know, find out about their coding experience and find out what their goals are. And then I am stuck with them until they reach their career goals. I coach them afterwards. I work with them. Um, and I think a lot of schools, like universities and colleges, have really separated these two areas. There's an admissions department, and then there's like guidance counseling. And none of them sort of have much to do with each other, where at HackerU it's totally integrated. Um, and so it's going to be a long time, I think, before I give up like this part of my role, this function. Because uh, I also find it fun. Um, and I think just the benefits totally outweigh the costs. Um, and that alignment of incentives is, is really important to me. Um, and like so much more, blah, blah, blah. There's like tons of things about HackerU. It's so great, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> the, the point, the point, I'm getting to the point of my talk. Um, so ultimately though, oh, there we go. Ultimately, like HackerU is like a tiny little speck. Uh, 
on you know, in the city, you know, when it comes to education in the city, we are a spec. In this province, we're an even tinier spec. And even like in this industry as a whole, Hacker is like this tiny little thing because there's so many public schools, so many middle schools, so many high schools, so many colleges, universities, private career colleges. Like there are just so many different things out there. And, you know, what we did with Hacker U was we took a very specific segment which was adults, motivated adults. And then we took a very specific topic, which in most cases at Hacker U was front end development. And we put those things together and we made like a really great little organization. But, you know, this is a really big industry. And at the end of the day, we're not really, we're not really changing it. We're just kind of flying under the radar, doing this thing that you probably, maybe in this room you've never even heard of us before because we're, we're pretty much you only hear about us through word of mouth. And so it's, it's really not changing a ton. It's not like I've solved you know, the problems or anything like that, not at all. But that is what actually gets me really excited. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we haven't proven anything yet, but it, it def what we're doing, it definitely brings up a lot of questions. So here, here are some of the things that I like to think about. Could something like HackerU work for other industries? Could this, could this model or this way of, of doing things, could it work as a way to train incredible entry-level marketers? Or could it be a way to train entrepreneurs? Um, there's lots of you know, people trying this and, and sort of working on it, but what if we really, really put some effort behind it? And what if somebody created a tiny little spec that trains the best marketers in the city? And then somebody else created a tiny little spec that trains the best chefs? Like, who knows? But maybe there are other ways, other industries that this kind of model could be used in. Um, then it's like the intensive approach, the immersive approach, where you know, all you do every day, all day for nine weeks is this one thing. You know, that's not really what college programs are like. College programs, you have you know, a three hour class once a week, and then you, know, you have another three hour class, maybe you have 15 hours of class in total. That is the opposite of an immersive. Um, and, and we've seen immersives work really, really well. So you know, can, you do a, can you train somebody in nine weeks full time to do an entirely different thing? Or what if you made it 12 weeks or 20 weeks? You know, maybe we don't need so many two year college courses because the last thing you want after going through a bunch of school like we all have done is to do another two years of college. Like that just is so unappealing, I think, to, to a lot of us that maybe there's more ways that we can intensify things and bring the timing down and, and make it so people can get started with their, with their careers or their dreams a little bit quicker. Um, I wonder if like, some of the lessons that we've learned at HackerU and some of the things we've been doing could make university better. Um, I, I think universities are really important. I don't think that they should disappear or that we shouldn't have them. I don't think that HackerU can replace universities. But you know, smaller classes and a lower ratio of students to instructors I think would go a long way. Um, access to instructors, being able to talk to them, getting to know them, you know, that could go a long way. Um, and like I said before, you know, I'd love to see us stop judging universities on the number of research papers that they're creating and judge them instead on how happy students are when they're there and how happy students are five years out. You know, I think that would be, that's like the school that wins on that scale is the one that I want to go to for sure. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think universities have a place in our world still, but I don't think they're doing a good enough job today. And, you know, the reason I believe that is because so many of my students are university graduates. Like that's, that for me is a little bit concerning. And then finally, what about kids? You know, because as I kind of started talking about like, you know, the public school system is, is one of the things that really bothers me. And, you know, can we do what we've done with HackerU starting from scratch and, and, you know, keeping our audience in mind? Can we do that for youth, for kids? Um, can we like mix up ages maybe and allow kids to be a little bit more self-directed with what they, what they want to learn or what they want to work on? Um, can we allow them to work on projects that actually use their talents so that they can figure out what they like and what they're good at when they're 12 instead of when they're 22? Um, can we top, stop telling our kids to study and get A's and instead you know, encourage them to actually do something interesting with their time. Um, and, and this is a shout out to Sammy, we were talking about this earlier this week, can we stop making failure so bad 
and instead make sure kids know that failure is how you know you're being challenged enough. You know, so about kids, um, I got married last month, which is nice, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm 27, uh, so kids are not in my immediate future for sure, um, that's a thing, uh, but getting married does get you thinking about it, and you know, for me, I believe truly that I had one of the like best available educational experiences. Like I had great teachers, you know, I you know, went to some great programs, I went to a great university with a you know, great reputation. And I, I generally, you know, enjoyed myself more so for what I did outside of school than in school. But you know, having one of the best available educational experiences, having that, and like I think about it and I don't want my kids to have that same experience. I really don't. Like I just think it's a waste of time. And so and so the question is, do we need another school that is designed from scratch? Um, because actually, I'd rather create another school uh, than send my kids to the public schools that are, that are sort of available to us today. And so maybe that is what I'll have to do. And I definitely will not be able to do that on my own. Uh, so if that's an idea that interests you, uh, I'd love to talk to you about it, maybe over the next couple years, we can make something interesting happen. And I just want to leave you all with a quote from Steve Jobs that uh, I was reminded of yesterday in an article I was reading. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people use. And that is exactly how I feel about our school system. And I think it's time for us to make some changes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you. Uh,